Nature compels us all to move through life. We could not remain stationary however much we wished. Every right-thinking person wants not merely to move through life like a sound-producing, perambulating plant, but to develop, to improve, and to continue the development mentally to the close of physical life. This development can occur only through the improvement of the quality of individual thought and the ideals, actions, and conditions that arise as a consequent. Hence, a study of the creative processes of thought and how to apply them is of supreme importance to each one of us. This knowledge is the means whereby the evolution of human life on earth may be hastened and uplifted in the process. Humanity ardently seeks the truth and explores every avenue to it. In this process, it has produced a special literature which ranges the whole gamut of thought from the trivial to the sublime, up from divination through all the philosophies to the final lofty truth of the master key. The master key is here given to the world as a means of tapping the great cosmic intelligence and attracting from it that which corresponds to the ambitions and aspirations of each reader. Everything and institution we see around us, created by human agency, had first to exist as a thought in some human mind. Thought, therefore, is constructive. Human thought is the spiritual power of the cosmos operating through its creature man. The master key instructs the reader how to use that power and use it both constructively and creatively. The things and conditions we desire to become realities we must first create in thought. The master key explains and guides the process. The master key teaching has hitherto been published in the form of a correspondence course of 24 lessons delivered to students one per week for 24 weeks. The reader who now receives the whole 24 parts at one time is warned not to attempt to read the book like a novel but to treat it as a course of study and conscientiously to imbibe the meaning of each part, reading and rereading one part only per week before proceeding to the next. Otherwise, the latter parts will tend to be misunderstood, and the reader's time and money will be wasted. Used as thus instructed, the master key will make of the reader a greater, better personality, and equipped with a new power to achieve any worthy personal purpose, and a new ability to enjoy life's beauty and wonder. Introduction by F. H. Burgess. Some men seem to attract success, power, wealth, attainment with very little conscious effort. Others conquer with great difficulty. Still others fail altogether to reach their ambitions, desires, and ideals. Why is this so? Why should some men realize their ambitions easily, others with difficulty, and still others not at all? The cause cannot be physical, else the most perfect men physically would be the most successful. The difference, therefore, must be mental, must be in the mind. Hence, mind must be the creative force, must constitute the sole difference between men. It is mind, therefore, which overcomes environment and every other obstacle in the path of man. When the creative power of thought is fully understood, its effect will be seen to be marvelous. But such results cannot be secured without proper application, diligence, and concentration. The student will find that the laws governing in the mental and spiritual world are as fixed and infallible as in the material world. S to secure the desired results, then, it is necessary to know the law and to comply with it. A proper compliance with the law will be found to produce the desired result with invariable exactitude. The student who learns that power comes from within, that he is weak only because he has depended on help from the outside, and who unhesitatingly throws himself on his own thought, instantly writes himself, stands erect, assumes a dominant attitude, and works miracles. It is evident, therefore, that he who fails to fully investigate and take advantage of the wonderful progress which is being made in this last and greatest science will soon be as far behind as the man who would refuse to acknowledge and accept the benefit which have accrued to mankind through an understanding of the laws of electricity. Of course, mind creates negative conditions just as readily as favorable conditions, and when we consciously or unconsciously visualize every kind of lack, limitation, and discord, we create these conditions. This is what many are unconsciously doing all of the time. This law, as well as every other law, is no respecter of persons, but is in constant operation and is relentlessly bringing to each individual exactly what he has created. In other words, whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. 
Abundance, therefore, depends upon a recognition of the laws of abundance, and the fact that mind is not only the creator, but the only creator of all there is. Certainly nothing can be created before we know that it can be created and then make the proper effort. There is no more electricity in the world today than there was 50 years ago. But until someone recognized the law by which it could be made of service, we received no benefit. Now that the law is understood, practically the whole world is lit by it. So with the law of abundance, it is only those who recognize the law and place themselves in harmony with it who share in its benefits. The scientific spirit now dominates every field of effort, relations of cause and effect are no longer ignored. The discovery of a region of law marked an epoch in human progress. It eliminated the element of uncertainty and caprice men's lives, and substituted law, reason, and certitude. Men now understand that for every result there is an adequate and definite cause, so that when a given result is desired, they seek the condition by which alone this result may be attained. The basis upon which all law rests was discovered by inductive reasoning, which consists of comparing a number of separate instances with one another until the common factor which gives rise to them all is seen. It is the method of study to which the civilized nations owe the greater part of their prosperity and the more valuable part of their knowledge. It has lengthened life. It has mitigated pain. It has spanned rivers. It has brightened the night with the splendor of day. It's extended the range of vision, accelerated motion, annihilated distance, facilitated intercourse, and enabled men to descend into the sea and into the air. What wonder, then, that men soon endeavored to extend the blessing of this system of study to their method of thinking, so that when it became plainly evident that certain results followed a particular method of thinking, it only remained to classify these results. This is method, and it's scientific and it is the only method by which we shall be permitted to retain that degree of liberty and freedom which we've been accustomed to look upon as an inalienable right, because a people is safe at home and in the world only if national preparedness means such things as growing surpluses of health, accumulated efficiency in public and private business, of whatever sort, continuous advance in the science and art of acting together, and the increasingly dominant endeavor to make all of these and all other aspects of national development centers and revolve about ascending life, single and collective, for which science, art, and ethics furnish guidance and controlling motives. The master key is based on absolute scientific truth and will unfold the possibilities that lie dormant in the individual and teach how they may be brought into powerful action to increase the person's effective capacity, bringing added energy, discernment, vigor, and mental elasticity. The student who gains an understanding of the mental laws which re-unfolded will come into the possession of an ability to secure results hitherto undreamed of, and which has rewards hardly to be expressed in words. It explains the correct use of both the receptive and active elements of the mental nature, and instructs the students in the recognition of opportunity. It strengthens the will and reasoning powers and teaches the cultivation and best uses of imagination, desire, the emotion. It gives initiative, tenacity of purpose, wisdom of choice, intelligent sympathy, and a thorough enjoyment of life on its higher planes. The master key teaches the use of mind power, true mind power, not any of the substitutes and perversions. It has nothing to do with hypnotism, magic, or any of the more or less fascinating deceptions by which many are led to think that something can be had for nothing. The master key cultivates and develops the understanding which will enable you to control the body and thereby the health. It improves and strengthens the memory. It develops insight, the kind of insight which is so rare, the kind which is the distinguishing characteristic of every successful businessman, the kind which enables men to discern opportunity close at hand. For thousands fail to see the opportunities almost within their grasp while they are industriously working with situations which under no possibility can be made to realize any substantial return. The master key develops mental power, which means that others instinctively recognize that you are a person of force, of character, that they want to do what you want them to do. It means that you attract men and things to you, that you are what some people call lucky, and that things just come your way, that you have come into an understanding of the fundamental laws of nature and have put yourself in harmony with them, that you are in tune with the infinite, that you understand the law of attraction, the natural laws of growth, and the psychological laws on which all advantages in the social and business world rest. Mental power is creative power. It gives you the ability to create for yourself. 
it does not mean the ability to take something away from someone else. Nature never does things that way. Nature makes two blades for grass grow wherever one grew before, and mind power enables men to do the same thing. The master key develops insight and sagacity, increased independence, the ability and disposition to be helpful. It destroys distrust, depression, fear, melancholia, and every form of lack, limitation, and weakness. That includes pain and disease. It awakens buried talents, supplies initiative, force, energy, and vitality. It awakens an appreciation of the beautiful in art, literature, and in science. It has changed the lives of thousands of men and women by substituting definite principles for uncertain and hazy methods, and principles for the foundation upon which every system of efficiency must rest. Albert Gary, the chairman of the United States Steel Corporation, said, The services of advisors, instructors, efficiency experts in successful management are indispensable to most business enterprises of magnitude. But I deem the recognition and adoption of right principles vastly more important. The master key teaches right principles and suggests methods for making a practical application of those very same principles. In that it differs from every other course of study, it teaches that the only possible value which can attach to any principle is in its application. Many read books, take home study courses, attend lectures all of their lives without ever making any progress in demonstrating the value of the principles involved. The master key suggests methods by which the value of the principles taught may be demonstrated and put in actual practice in the daily experience. There is a change in the thought of the world. This change is silently transpiring in our midst and is more important than any which the world has undergone since the downfall of paganism. Science has of late made such vast discoveries, has revealed such an infinity of resources, has unveiled such enormous possibilities and such unsuspected forces, that scientific men more and more hesitate to affirm certain theories as established, and indubitably or to deny certain other theories as absurd or impossible. And so a new civilization is being born. Customs, creeds, and cruelty are passing. Vision, faith, and service are taking their place. The fetters of tradition are being melted off from humanity, and as the dross of materialism is being consumed, thought is being liberated, and truth is rising full-orbed before an astonished multitude. The whole world is on the eve of a new consciousness, a new power, and a new consciousness, a new power, a new realization of the resources within itself. The last century saw the most magnificent material progress in history. The present century will produce the greatest progress in mental and spiritual power. Physical science has resolved matter into molecules, molecules into atoms, and atoms into energy, and it has remained for Sir Ambrose Fleming in an address before the Royal Institution to resolve this energy into mind. He says, in its ultimate essence, energy may be incomprehensible by us, except as an exhibition of the direct operation of that which we call mind or will. Now let's see what are the most powerful forces in nature. In the mineral world, everything is solid and fixed. In the animal and vegetable kingdom, it's in a state of flux, forever changing, always being created and recreated. In the atmosphere, we find heat, light, and energy. Each realm becomes finer and more spiritual as we pass from the visible to the invisible, from the coarse to the fine, from the low potentiality to high potential. When we reach the invisible, we find energy in its purest and most volatile state. And as the most powerful forces of nature are the invisible forces, so we find that the most powerful forces of man are his invisible forces, his spiritual force. And the only way in which the spiritual force can manifest is through the process of thinking. Thinking is the only activity which the spirit possesses, and thought is the only product of thinking. Addition and subtraction are therefore a spiritual transaction. Reasoning is a spiritual process. Ideas are spiritual conceptions. Questions are spiritual searchlights. And logic, argument, and philosophy is spiritual machinery. Every thought brings into action certain physical tissue, parts of the brain, nerve, or muscle. This produces an actual physical change in the construction of the tissue. Therefore, it is only necessary to have a certain number of thoughts on a given subject in order to bring about a complete change in the physical organization of a man. This is the process by which failure is changed to success. Thoughts of courage, power, inspiration, harmony, are substituted for thoughts of failure, despair, lack, limitation, and discord. And as these thoughts take root, the physical tissue is changed and the individual sees life in a new light. 
Old things have actually passed away. All things have become new. He is born again, this time born of the Spirit. Life has a new meaning for him. He is reconstructed and is filled with joy, confidence, hope, and energy. He sees opportunities to success to which he was heretofore blind. He recognizes possibilities which before had no meaning for him. The thought of success with which he has been impregnated are radiated to those around him, and they in turn help him onward and upward. He attracts to him new and successful associates, and this in turn changes his environment, so that by this simple exercise of thought, a man changes not only himself, but his environment, circumstances, and conditions. You will see, you must see, that we are at the dawn of a new day, that the possibilities are so wonderful, so fascinating, and so limitless as to be almost bewildering. A century ago, any man with an airplane or even a Gatling gun could have annihilated a whole army equipped with the implements of warfare then in use. And so it is at present. Any man with a knowledge of the possibilities contained in the master key has an inconceivable advantage over the multitude. The Master Key System. It is my privilege to enclose herewith Part 1 of the Master Key System. Would you bring into your life more power to get the power consciousness, more health to get the health consciousness, more happiness, get the happiness consciousness? Live the spirit of these things until they become yours by right. It will then become impossible to keep them from you. The things of the world are fluid to a power within man by which he rules them. You need not acquire this power. You already have it. But you want to understand it. You want to use it. You want to control it. You want to impregnate yourself with it so that you can go forward and carry the world before you. Day by day, as you go on and on, and as you gain momentum, as your inspiration deepens, as your plans crystallize, as you gain understanding, you'll come to realize that this world is no dead pile of stones and timber, but it is a living thing. It's made up of the beating hearts of humanity. It is a thing of life and beauty. It is evident that it requires understanding to work with material of this description. But those who come into this understanding are inspired by a new light, a new force. They gain confidence and greater power each day. They realize their hopes and their dreams come true. Life has a deeper, fuller, clearer meaning than ever before. And now, Part 1. Chapter 1. That much gathers more is true on every plane of existence, and that loss leads to greater loss is equally true. Mind is creative, and conditions, environment, and all experiences in life are the result of our habitual or predominant mental attitude. The attitude of mind necessarily depends upon what we think. Therefore, the secret of all power, all achievement, and all possession depends upon our method of thinking. This is true because we must be before we can do and we can do only to the extent which we are, and what we are depends upon what we think. We cannot express powers that we do not possess. The only way by which we may secure possession of power is to become conscious of power, and we can never become conscious of power until we learn that all power is from within. There is a world within, a world of thought and feeling and power, of light and life and beauty, and although invisible, its forces are mighty. The world within is governed by mind. When we discover this world, we shall find the solution for every problem, the cause for every effect, and since the world within is subject to our control, all laws of power and possessions are also within our control. The world without is a reflection of the world within. What appears without is what has been found within. In the world within may be found infinite wisdom, infinite power, infinite supply of all that is necessary waiting for unfoldment development, and expression. If we recognize these potentialities in the world within, they will take form in the world without. Harmony in the world within will be reflected in the world without by harmonious conditions, agreeable surroundings, the best of everything. It's the foundation of health and a necessary essential to all greatness, all power, all attainment, all achievement, and all success. Harmony in the world within means the ability to control our thoughts and to determine for ourselves 
how any experience is to affect us. Harmony in the world within results in optimism and affluence. Affluence within results in affluence without. The world without reflects the circumstances and the conditions of the consciousness within. If we find wisdom in the world within, we shall have the understanding to discern the marvelous possibilities that are latent in the world within, and we shall be given the power to make these possibilities manifest in the world without. As we become conscious of the wisdom in the world within, we mentally take possession of this wisdom, and by taking mental possession, we come into actual possession of the power and wisdom necessary to bring into manifestation the essentials necessary for our most complete and harmonious development. The world within is the practical world in which the men and women of power generate courage, hope, enthusiasm, confidence, trust, and faith by which they are given the fine intelligence to see the vision and the practical skill to make that vision real. Life is an unfoldment, not accretion. What comes to us in the world without is what we already possess in the world within. All possession is based on consciousness. All gain is the result of an accumulative consciousness. All loss is the result of a scattering consciousness. Mental efficiency is contingent upon harmony. Discord means confusion. Therefore, he who would acquire power must be in harmony with natural law. We are related to the world without by the objective mind. The brain is the organ of this mind, and the cerebrospinal system of nerves puts us in conscious communication with every part of the body. This system of nerves responds to every sensation of light, heat, odor, sound, and taste. When this mind thinks correctly, when it understands the truth, when the thoughts sent through the cerebrospinal nervous system to the body are constructive, these sensations are pleasant and harmonious. The result is that we build strength, vitality, and all constructive forces into our body. But it is through this same objective mind that all distress, sickness, lack, limitation, and every form of discord and inharmony is admitted into our lives. It is therefore through the objective mind by wrong thinking that we are related to all destructive forces. We are related to the world within by the subconscious mind. The solar plexus is the organ of this mind. The sympathetic system of nerves presides over all subjective sensations, such as joy, fear, love, emotion, respiration, imagination, and all other subconscious phenomena. It is through the subconscious that we are connected with the universal mind and brought into relation with the infinite constructive forces of the universe. It is the coordination of these two centers of our being and the understanding of their functions which is the great secret of life. With this knowledge, we can bring the objective and subjective minds into conscious cooperation and thus coordinate the finite and the infinite. Our future is entirely within our own control. It is not at the mercy of any capricious or uncertain external power. Now all agree that there is but one principle or consciousness pervading the entire universe, occupying all space and being essentially the same in kind at every point of its presence. It is all-powerful, all wisdom and always present. All thoughts and things are within itself. It is all in all. There is but one consciousness in the universe able to think, and when it thinks, its thoughts become objective things to do. As this consciousness is omnipresent, it must be present within every individual. Each individual must be a manifestation of that omnipotent, omniscient, and omnipresent consciousness. As there is only one consciousness in the universe that is able to think it, necessarily follows that your consciousness is identical with the universal consciousness. Or in other words, all mind is one mind. There is no dodging this conclusion. The consciousness that focuses in your brain cells is the same consciousness which focuses in the brain cells of every other individual. Each individual is but the individualization of the universal, the cosmic mind. The universal mind is static or potential energy. It simply is. It can manifest only through the individual, and the individual can manifest only through the universal. They are one. The ability of the individual to think is his ability to act on the universal and bring it into manifestation. Human consciousness consists only in the ability of man to think. Mind in and of itself is believed to be a subtle form of static energy, 
from which arises the activities called thought, which is the dynamic phase of mind. Mind is static energy. Thought is dynamic energy, the two phases of the same thing. Thought is therefore the vibratory force formed by converting static mind into dynamic mind. As the sum of all attributes are contained in the universal mind, which is omnipotent, omniscient, and omnipresent, these attributes must be present at all times in their potential form in every individual. Therefore, when the individual thinks, the thought is compelled by its nature to embody itself in an objectivity or condition which will correspond with its origin. Every thought, therefore, is a cause and every condition an effect. For this reason, it is absolutely essential that you control your thoughts so as to bring forth only desirable conditions. All power is from within and is absolutely under your control. It comes through exact knowledge and by the voluntary exercises of exact principles. It should be plain that when you acquire a thorough understanding of this law and are able to control your thought processes, you can apply it to any condition. In other words, you will have come into conscious cooperation with omnipotent law, which is the fundamental basis of all things. The universal mind is the life principle of every atom which is in existence. Every atom is continually striving to manifest more life. All are intelligent, and all are seeking to carry out the purpose for which they were created. A majority of mankind lives in the world without. Few have found the world within, and yet it is the world within that makes the world without. It is therefore creative, and everything which you find in your world without has been created by you in the world within. This system will bring you into a realization of power which will be yours when you understand this relation between the world without and the world within. The world within is the cause, the world without the effect. To change the effect, you must change the cause. You will at once see that this is a radically new and different idea. Most men try to change effects by working with effect. They fail to see that this is simply changing one form of distress for another. To remove discord, we must remove the cause, and this cause can be found only in the world within. All growth is from within. This is evident in all nature. Every plant, every animal, every human is a living testimony to this great law, and the error of the ages is in looking for strength or power from without. The world within is the universal fountain of supply, and the world without is the outlet to the stream. Our ability to receive depends upon our recognition of this universal fountain, this infinite energy of which each individual is an outlet, and so is one with every other individual. Recognition is a mental process. Mental action is therefore the interaction of the individual upon the universal mind. And as the universal mind is the intelligence which pervades all space and animates all living things, this mental action and reaction is the law of causation. But the principle of causation does not obtain in the individual, but in the universal mind. It is not an objective faculty, but a subjective process and the results are seen in an infinite variety of conditions and experiences. In order to express life, there must be mind. Nothing can exist without mind. Everything which does exist is some manifestation of this one basic substance from which and by which all things have been created and are continually being recreated. We live in a fathomless sea of plastic mind substance. This substance is ever alive and active, it is sensitive to the highest degree. It takes form according to the mental demand. Thought forms the mold or matrix from which the substance expresses. Remember that it is in the application alone that the value consists, and that a practical understanding of this law will substitute abundance for poverty, wisdom for ignorance, harmony for discord, and freedom for tyranny. And certainly there can be no greater blessing than these from a material and social standpoint. Now make the application. Select a room where you can be alone and undisturbed. Sit erect comfortably, but do not lounge. Let your thoughts roam where they will, but be perfectly still for from 15 minutes to half an hour. Continue this for three days or four days, or for a week until you secure full control of your physical being. Many will find this extremely difficult. Others will conquer with ease, but it is absolutely essential to secure complete control of the body before you are ready to progress. Next week you'll receive instructions for the next step. In the meantime, you must have mastered this one. (laughs) 
Our difficulties are largely due to confused ideas and ignorance of our true interests. The great task is to discover the laws of nature to which we are to adjust ourselves. Clear thinking and moral insight are therefore of incalculable value. All processes, even those of thought, rest on solid foundations. The keener the sensibilities, the more acute the judgment. The more delicate the taste, the more refined the moral feelings. The more subtle the intelligence, the loftier the aspiration. The purer and more intense are the gratifications which existence yields. Hence it is that the study of the best that has been thought in the world gives supreme pleasure. The powers, uses, and possibilities of the mind under the new interpretations are incomparably more wonderful than the most extravagant accomplishment or even dreams of material progress. Thought is energy. Active thought is active energy. Concentrated thought is a concentrated energy. Thought concentrated on a definite purpose becomes power. This is the power which is being used by those who do not believe in the virtue of poverty or the beauty of self-denial. They perceive that this is the talk of weaklings. The ability to receive and manifest this power depends upon the ability to recognize the infinite energy ever dwelling in man, constantly creating and recreating his body and mind, and ready at any moment to manifest through him in any needful manner. In exact proportion to the recognition of this truth will be the manifestation in the outer life of the individual. Chapter 2 the operations of the mind are produced by two parallel modes of activity, the one conscious and the other subconscious. Professor Davidson says, quote, He who thinks to illuminate the whole range of mental action by the light of his own consciousness is not unlike the one who should go about to illuminate the universe with a rushlight, end quote. The subconscious logical processes are carried on with a certainty and regularity which would be impossible if there existed the possibility of error. Our mind is so designed that it prepares for us the most important foundations of cognition, whilst we have not the slightest apprehension of the modus operandi. The subconscious soul, like a benevolent stranger, works and makes provisions for our benefit, pouring only the mature fruit into our lap. Thus, ultimate analysis of thought processes shows that the subconscious is the theater of the most important mental phenomena. It is through the subconscious that Shakespeare must have perceived without effort, great truths which are hidden from the conscious mind of the student, that Phidias fashioned marble and bronze, that Raphael painted Madonnas, and Beethoven composed symphonies. Ease and perfection depend entirely upon the degree in which we cease to depend upon the consciousness. Playing the piano, skating, operating the typewriter, the skilled trades depend for their perfect execution on the process of the subconscious mind. The marvel of playing a brilliant piece on the piano while at the same time conducting a vigorous conversation, shows the greatness of our subconscious powers. We are all aware how dependent we are upon the subconscious, and the greater the nobler, the more brilliant our thoughts are, the more it is obvious to ourselves that the origin lies beyond our ken. We find ourselves endowed with tact, instinct, sense of the beautiful in art, music, or whose origin or dwelling place we are wholly unconscious. The values of the subconscious is enormous. It inspires us. It warns us. It furnishes us with names, facts, and scenes from the storehouse of memory. It directs our thoughts, tastes, and accomplishments, and our tasks so intricate that no conscious mind, even if it had the power, has the capacity for. We can walk at will. We can raise the arm whenever we choose to do so. We can give our attention through eye or ear to any subject at pleasure. On the other hand, we cannot stop our heartbeats, nor the circulation of the blood, nor the growth of the stature, nor the formation of nerve and muscle tissue, nor the building of the bones, nor many other important vital processes. If we compare these two sets of action, the one decreed by the will of the moment and the other proceeding in majestic, rhythmic course, subject to no vacillation, but constant at every moment, we stand in awe of the latter, and we ask to have the mystery explained. We see at once that these are the vital processes of our physical life, and we cannot avoid the inference that these all-important functions are designedly withdrawn from the domain of our outward will with its variations and transitions and placed under the direction of a permanent and dependable power within us. Of these two powers, the outward and changeable has been termed the conscious mind or the objective mind, dealing with outward objects. 
the interior power is called the subconscious mind or the subjective mind, and besides its work on the mental plane, it controls the regular functions which make physical life possible. It is necessary to have a clear understanding of their respective functions on the mental plane as well as of certain other basic principles. Perceiving and operating through the five physical senses, the conscious mind deals with the impressions and objects of the outward life. It has the faculty of discrimination, carrying with it the responsibility of choice. It has the power of reasoning, whether inductive, deductive, analytical, or syllogistic. And this power may be developed to a high degree. It is the seat of the will with all the energies that flow therefrom. Not only can it impress other minds, but it can direct the subconscious mind. In this way, the conscious mind becomes the responsible ruler and guardian of the subconscious mind. It is this high function which can completely reverse conditions in your life. It is often true that conditions of fear, worry, poverty, disease, inharmony, and evils of all kinds dominate us by reason of false suggestions accepted by the unguarded subconscious mind. All this the trained conscious mind can entirely prevent by its vigilant, protective action. It may properly be called the watchman at the gate of the great subconscious domain. One writer has expressed the chief distinction between the two phases of mind thus, quote, Conscious mind is reasoning will. Subconscious mind is instinctive desire, the result of past reasoning will, end quote. The subconscious mind draws just and accurate inferences from premises furnished from outside sources. Where the premise is true, the subconscious mind reaches a faultless conclusion. But where the premise or suggestion is an error, the whole structure falls. The subconscious mind does not engage in the process of proving. It relies upon the conscious mind, the watchman at the gate, to guard it from the mistaken impressions. Receiving any suggestion as true, the subconscious mind at once proceeds to act thereon in the whole domain of its tremendous field of work. The conscious mind can suggest either truth or error. If the latter, it is at the cost of wide-reaching peril to the whole being. The conscious mind ought to be on duty during every waking hour, when the watchman is off guard, or when its calm judgment is suspended under a variety of circumstances, then the subconscious mind is unguarded and left open to suggestion from all sources. During the wild excitement of panic, or during the height of anger, or the impulses of the irresponsible mob, or at any other time of unrestrained passion, the conditions are most dangerous. The subconscious mind is then open to the suggestion of fear, hatred, selfishness, greed, self-deprecation, and other negative forces derived from surrounding persons or circumstances. The result is usually unwholesome in the extreme, with effects that may endure to distress it for a long time. Hence the great importance of guarding the subconscious mind from false impressions. The subconscious mind perceives by intuition. Hence its processes are rapid. It does not wait for the slow methods of conscious reasoning. In fact, it cannot employ them. The subconscious mind never sleeps, never rests, any more than does your heart or your blood. It has been found that by plainly stating to the subconscious mind, certain specific things to be accomplished, forces are set in operation that lead to the result desired. Here then is a source of power which places us in touch with omnipotence. Herein is a deep principle which is well worth our most earnest study. The operation of this law is very interesting. Those who put it into operation find that when they go out to meet the person with whom they anticipate a difficult interview, Something has been there before them, and dissolved the supposed differences. Everything has changed. All is harmonious. They find that when some difficult business problem presents itself, they can afford to make delay, and something suggests the proper solution. Everything is properly arranged. In fact, those who have learned to trust the subconscious find that they have infinite resources at their command. Now, last time I gave you an exercise for the purpose of securing control of the physical body. If you've accomplished this, you are ready to advance. This time, you'll begin to control your thought. Always take the same room, the same chair, and the same position, if possible. In some cases, it is not convenient to take the same room. In this case, simply make the best use of such conditions as may be available. Now be perfectly still, as before, but inhibit all thought. 
This will give you control over all thoughts of care, worry, and fear, and will enable you to entertain only the kind of thoughts that you desire. Continue this exercise until you gain complete mastery. You'll not be able to do this for more than a few moments at a time, but the exercise is valuable because it will be a very practical demonstration of the great number of thoughts which are constantly trying to gain access into your mental world. Next time you'll receive instructions for an exercise which may be a little more interesting, but it is necessary that you master this one first. You have found that the individual may act on the universal, and that the result of this action and interaction is cause and effect. Thought, therefore, is the cause, and the experiences with which you meet in life are the effect. Eliminate, therefore, any possible tendency to complain of conditions as they have been or as they are, because it rests with you to change them and make them what you would like them to be. Direct your effort to a realization of the mental resources always at your command from which all real and lasting power comes. Persist in this practice until you come to a realization of the fact that there can be no failure in the accomplishment of any proper object in life if you but understand your power and persist in your object, because the mind forces are ever ready to lend themselves to a purposeful will in the effort to crystallize thought and desire into actions, events, and conditions. Whereas in the beginning of each function of life and each action is the result of conscious thought, the habitual actions become automatic and the thought that controls them passes into the realm of the subconscious. Yet it is just as intelligent as before. It is necessary that it becomes automatic or subconscious in order that the self-conscious mind may attend to other things. The new actions will, however, in their turn, become habitual, then automatic, and then subconscious in order that the mind again may be freed from this detail and advanced to still other activities. When you realize this, you will have found a source of power which will enable you to take care of any situation in life which may develop. And now part three. The necessary interaction of the conscious and subconscious mind requires a similar interaction between the corresponding systems of nerves. Judge Troward indicates the very beautiful method in which this interaction is affected. He says, and I quote, the cerebrospinal system is the organ of the conscious mind, and the sympathetic is the organ of the subconscious. The cerebrospinal is the channel through which we receive conscious perception from the physical senses and exercise control over the movements of the body. This system of nerves has its center in the brain. End quote. The sympathetic system has its center in a ganglionic mass at the back of the stomach known as the solar plexus, and is the channel of that mental action which unconsciously supports the vital functions of the body. The connection between the two systems is made by the vagus nerve, which passes out of the cerebral region as a portion of the voluntary system to the thorax, sending out branches to the heart and lungs, and finally passing through the diaphragm. It looses its outer coating and becomes identified with the nerves of the sympathetic system, so forming a connecting link between the two and making man physically a single entity. We have seen that every thought is received by the brain, which is the organ of the conscious. It is here subjected to our power of reasoning. When the objective mind has been satisfied that the thought is true, it is sent to the solar plexus, or the brain of the subjective mind, to be made into our flesh, to be brought forth into the world as reality. It is then no longer susceptible to any argument whatever. The subconscious mind cannot argue. It only acts. It accepts the conclusions of the objective mind as final. The solar plexus has been likened to the sum of the body because it is a central point of distribution for the energy which the body is constantly generating. This energy is very real energy, and this sun is a very real sun, and the energy is being distributed by very real nerves to all parts of the body and is thrown off in an atmosphere which envelops the body. If this radiation is sufficiently strong, the person is called magnetic. He is said to be filled with personal magnetism. Now, such a person may wield an immense power for good. His presence alone will often bring comfort to the troubled minds with which he comes in contact. When the solar plexus is in active operation and is radiating life, energy, and vitality to every part of the body and to every one whom he meets, the sensations are pleasant. The body is filled with health, and all with whom he comes in contact experience a pleasant sensation. If there is any interruption of this radiation, the sensations are unpleasant. The flow of life and energy to some part of the body is stopped, 
and this is the cause of every ill to the human race, physical, mental, or environmental. Physical, because the sun of the body is no longer generating sufficient energy to vitalize some part of the body. Mental, because the conscious mind is dependent upon the subconscious mind for the vitality necessary to support its thought. And environmental, because the connection between the subconscious mind and the universal mind is being interrupted. The solar plexus is the point at which the part meets with the whole, where the finite becomes infinite, where the uncreate becomes create, the universal becomes individualized, the invisible becomes visible. It is the point at which life appears, and there is no limit to the amount of life an individual may generate from this solar center. This center of energy is omnipotent because it is the point of contact with all life and all intelligence. It can, therefore, accomplish whatever it is directed to accomplish. And herein lies the power of the conscious mind. The subconscious can and will carry out such plans and ideas as may be suggested to it by the conscious mind. Conscious thought then is the master of this sun center, from which the life and energy of the entire body flows, and the quality of the thought which we entertain determines the quality of the thought which this sun will radiate, and the character of the thought which our conscious mind entertains will determine the character of the thought which this sun will radiate. And the nature of the thought which our conscious mind entertains will determine the nature of thought which the sun will radiate, and consequently will determine the nature of the experience which will result. It is evident, therefore, that all we have to do is let our light shine. The more energy we can radiate, the more rapidly shall we be enabled to transmute undesirable conditions into sources of pleasure and profit. The important question then is how to let this light shine, and how to generate this energy. Non-resistant thought expands the solar plexus. Resistant thought contracts it. Pleasant thought expands it. Unpleasant thought contracts it. Thoughts of courage, power, confidence, and hope all produce a corresponding state. But the one arch enemy of the solar plexus, which must be absolutely destroyed before there is any possibility of letting any light shine, is fear. This enemy must be completely destroyed. He must be eliminated. He must be expelled forever. He is the cloud which hides the sun, which causes a perpetual gloom. It is this personal devil which makes men fear the past, the present, and the future, fear themselves, their friends, and their enemies, fear everything and everybody. When fear is effectually and completely destroyed, your light will shine, the clouds will disperse, and you'll have found the source of power, energy, and life. When you find that you're really one with the infinite power, and when you can consciously realize. That this power, by a practical demonstration of your ability to overcome any adverse condition by the power of your thought, then you will have nothing to fear. Fear will have been destroyed, and you will have come into possession of your birthright. It is our attitude of mind toward life which determines the experiences with which we are to meet. If we expect nothing, we shall have nothing. If we demand much, we shall receive the greater portion. The world is harsh only as we fail to assert ourselves. The criticism of the world is bitter only to those who cannot compel room for their ideas. It is fear of this criticism that causes many ideas to fail to see the light of day. But the man who knows that he has a solar plexus will not fear criticism or anything else. He will be too busy radiating courage, confidence, and power. He will anticipate success by his mental attitude. He will pound barriers to pieces. He will leap over the chasm of doubt and hesitation which fear places in his path. A knowledge of our ability to consciously radiate health, strength, and harmony will bring us into a realization that there is nothing to fear because we're in touch with infinite strength. Now, this knowledge can be gained only by making practical application of this information. We learn by doing. Through practice, the athlete becomes powerful. As the following statement is of considerable importance, I will put it in several ways so that you cannot fail to get the full significance of it. If you are religiously inclined, I would say that you can let your light shine. If your mind has a bias toward physical science, I would say that you can wake the solar plexus, or if you prefer the strictly scientific interpretation, I will say that you can impress your subconscious mind. I've already told you what the result of this impression will be. It is the method in which you are now interested. You've already learned that the subconscious is intelligent and that it is creative and responsive to the will of the conscious mind. What then is the most natural way of making the desired impression? Mentally concentrate on the object of your desire. When you are concentrating, you are impressing the subconscious. This is not the only way, but it is a simple and effective way, and the most direct way, and consequently the way in which the best results are secured. 
It is the method which is producing such extraordinary results that many think that miracles are being accomplished. It is the method by which every great inventor, every great financier, every great statesman has been enabled to convert the subtle and invisible force of desire, faith, and confidence into actual, tangible, concrete facts in the objective world. The subconscious mind is a part of the universal mind. The universal is the creative principle of the universe. A part must be the same in kind and quality as the whole. This means that this creative power is absolutely unlimited. It is not bound by precedent of any kind and consequently has no prior existing pattern by which to apply its constructive principle. We have found that the subconscious mind is responsive to our conscious will, which means that the unlimited creative power of the universal mind is within control of the conscious mind of the individual. When making a practical application of this principle, in accordance with the exercises given in the subsequent lessons, it is well to remember that it is not necessary to outline the method by which the subconscious will produce the results you desire. The finite cannot inform the infinite. You are simply to say what you desire, not how you are to obtain it. You are the channel by which the undifferentiated is being differentiated, and this differentiation is being accomplished by appropriation. It only requires recognition to set causes in motion, which will bring about results in accordance with your desire, and this is accomplished because the universal can act only through the individual, and the individual can act only through the universal. They are one. For your exercise this week, I will ask you to go to one step further. I want you to not only be perfectly still and inhibit all thought as far as possible, but relax. Let go. Let the muscles take their normal condition. This will remove all pressure from the nerves and eliminate that tension which so frequently produces physical exhaustion. Physical relaxation is a voluntary exercise of the will and the exercise will be found to be of great value as it enables the blood to circulate freely to and from the brain and the body. Tension leads to mental unrest and abnormal mental activity of the mind. It produces worry, care, fear, and anxiety. Relaxation is therefore an absolute necessity in order to allow the mental faculties to exercise the greatest freedom. Make this exercise as thorough and complete as possible. Mentally determine that you will relax every muscle and nerve until you feel quiet and restful and at peace with yourself and the world. The solar plexus will then be ready to function and you're going to be very surprised at the result. Thank you.